number four, I believe, of LTTV Weekly, just to get that right. As usual, I'm joined by the man with the longest title in world rugby, head coach slash director of rugby in waiting, Jordan Murphy, who, like me, is on brand tonight. And then putting us to shame this evening is the best dressed man in world rugby, Yan McGinnity. I'll start with you, Yan, so people can just get an insight into how you dress at home. Um, how's lockdown going? Because it looks quite nice. I obviously had a bit of time to spend indoors and uh, make sure the house is looking nice. Um, my homeschooling efforts are incredibly poor. I've been delegated with the exercise regimes, which I can just about handle. Um, I've suddenly got used to the technology that is Zoom and having to formulate most of my day around that. Um, trying to make sure kids don't run into meetings has been quite an entertaining sideline but um on the whole we're just about surviving it's, it's in many regards it's been great to spend time with the kids just a lot of the time we're away from home a fair bit or working long hours so it's been nice to see them i think we're all looking forward this weekend to getting some good news around what coming out of lockdown might look like but in all honesty i think we are in the same position as every single other industry it's still so much is unknown so trying to keep the kids positive and ourselves positive. Just to be fair, the best thing has been the weather's been amazing for bar one week of the six we've been in lockdown. So we'll get there. You've got to stay positive. Obviously, we've been busy, um, as we'll talk about later. But um, no, all good in this household. Thanks, sir. I mean, you nicely deflected away from the fact that you are completely suited up as well. So... Well, I felt like I had to live up to the expectation you'd set when on social media said I was coming on and hinted that I tended to try and dress up at Oval Park. And I always find it ironic when I go to Oval Park and there's a number of Antipodeans commenting on my dress sense and players as well walking around in sliders and shorts. Um, so I just thought I'd, I was probably to do also with keeping my uh, boredom levels getting them away from them so that I thought, well, I'd make an effort for you. So there we go. <laughs> but Jordy, I mean, you look terrible. Compared to <laughs> yeah, mate, I'm having real world problems of a, uh, trying to figure out when I can get my hair cut or how I'm going to do that. And I know before you say it, it's not exactly a, a massive issue, particularly with a, uh, with the amount of hair that I have. Um, but my, my wife is a uh, reluctant to take the clippers to it. Um, <laughs> She's, she's terrified because she thinks it could be the last last haircut and um, she doesn't want to be responsible for it. So um, yeah, I'm currently having to uh, actually put hair gel in for the first time in 20 odd years. <laughs> I, uh, I understand your worries there. I'm, I keep finding hair ties. <laughs> well, I, hair. I, I think if it wasn't for lockdown, obviously you'd have uh, been in for the short back and sides. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that, was, that was on the agenda, but I uh, obviously <laughs> got put off slightly. You mentioned a busy week. Um, or alluded to a busy week. You two have probably been the busiest of people this week. Um, recruitment week, if we're going to give it a title, uh, a couple of ins and outs. So let's start with the outs because I'd like to look forward and no disrespect to those that have departed, but the general feeling online is that it is a very large list of departing players. But I think when you break it down, Jordi, I'll ask you first, it's pretty stock standard, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. I think we go through these numbers every year. I think that was skewed slightly. Sam Harrison left at Christmas and we had some lone bodies to come in to cover us for injuries. We've touched a lot on the guys who are leaving and you know they've given their all for Leicester Tigers and we're grateful for that. But as you say, it's nature of the sport that people move on. We're trying to build and move in a new direction and the guys that we're bringing in are very, very exciting and we're really focusing on that. I mean... Yeah, and for you, it's never an easy time of year for anyone in your role. Obviously, the first time you've been in this position at Tigers. Uh, how different has it been in terms of maybe not being able to sit across a table from someone and have the conversation? Yeah, I think in particular, the, as Geordie touched on it, sometimes some really tough decisions have to be made. Um, and obviously, in a, especially in this current environment where there's a lot of uncertainty anyway, it's always tough to effectively inform individuals that they're no longer going to be part of the journey. Um, just touch on the numbers. I think the reality is that Geordie inherited a squad that, and wants to look to try and change it more in his DNA. 
and with Steve coming in as well, he's got certain thoughts on that as well. So I think ultimately we know those numbers. We want them to come down. We want guys to be part here for a long, all their career in some instances. But we know in some instances we need to change that dynamic. Um, we also know that there are some players that are unfortunately getting past 30 and onwards. And so sometimes we know that the Premiership is such a harsh competition that you do need guys that can front up every week. And the reality is that in some positions you do have to look at slightly younger athletes that can actually sustain that high level of intensity. So, um, yeah, the numbers are high. We obviously wish those that go on and, and secure future employment elsewhere the best intentions, but that we, we'd all like to be able to sit down, have these conversations face-to-face -face and with their representatives and explain in person what's gone on. But unfortunately, that hasn't been possible. But I think one of the things that's come out of this whole pandemic is the fact that we found other alternatives to try to continue to communicate and the communication has been crucial to those um, whether that's players having to look for other alternatives us communicating to the players moving forward what's going on with the club when we're going to actually start potential restart dates and pre-season so um, I think we've done it as well as we can there's also always going to be instances of players that don't necessarily see it that way but I'm confident because ultimately, we've, we've done, I've done this a number of times. Geordie's been on the other side of this as a player and seen colleagues go down this route where they're no longer going to be at the same club for the following season. So we're aware of what that looks like. We're aware of what that actually feels like when you're on the other side of the fence. So we try to be as good about it as we can be. I think the chairman's helped as well, um, as have some of the other coaches. So it's tough. But I do believe we've done a good job about it. And we'll also improve on it because no recruitment operations ever finite. You've got to improve the whole time to stay ahead of your game. And I think we want to improve the system and we'll get there and we'll improve it. So hopefully that's reflected in the way the players feel about how they've been treated. Geordie, to put you on the spot, um, give you a question you might not be expecting as well. And sorry if it comes across a little bit rude. Not that I'm overly sorry. But the reality too, or the harsh reality even, is the club has been positioned 11th for consecutive seasons. You have to make changes, don't you? Oh, 100%. You know, I think we said we, we haven't been good enough and, and we need to start a, uh, a new journey. Um, Jan's touched on, you know, some of the reasons there. And, and um, you know, it was always our intentions to try and tweak the squad and, and go younger and, and really strengthen the, the, the academy players coming through. It's been going to be huge for us. So we want to strengthen from within, uh, and that's obviously going to be very important for us going forward. Um, we are a, uh, we're where we deserve to be, obviously, sort of halfway through a season, um, going into a uh, some fixtures at home, which you know potentially are, are you know strong games for us. But um, yeah, yeah, as you said, hands up, we, we haven't been good enough. We need to start again. So uh, this gives us a nice opportunity to to uh, start afresh. One guy I do want to single out before we move on to the well, coaching appointments, the big coaching appointments, is Jimmy Stevens. Um, never nice to see a player retire before they should. Never nice to see a player retire from concussion. He was a very young player when you were coming towards the end of your career. Geordie? Yeah, Jimmy made his debut in, in 2012 when I was still playing. Um, I was in the squad then for, for one year with him, and he's a great guy, um, very highly thought of in the squad. Uh, a real grafter, a pleasure to coach, and that you know just gave 100% in every session. And um, yeah, th this last couple of years just struggled with some head knocks, and and that's the scariest thing from a from a coaching point of view because I, I think Jimmy's done the right thing um, to look after his long term uh, health, and he was advised to retire. And although um, it's very very sad, I think he's made the, the, a really smart decision. Um, it's never easy to see a player. Everyone wants to 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 sign out at their own on their own terms unfortunately that's not the case and um, I think players now are, are more and more aware that, that sometimes it, it just stops uh, gets taken away from you and it's sad but I am um, Jimmy will have his health I guess as we move on to the biggest news of the week no disrespect to the young kids and, and Johnny McPhillips but Jordy Rob Taylor uh, without disrespecting Rob too not a headline act in terms of one of the most well-known coaches in the game Tell me about Rob Taylor and why Rob Taylor was the man to come in to lead the side's attack. Oh, this was a process that we have been involved in for, for quite a while. Um, it wasn't just a, uh, 
a short-term move. Jan had been doing a lot of uh, yeah, work behind the scenes along with Jed, Simon Cohen, um, myself and Steve have obviously had input into it as well in, in finding the right man for Leicester Tigers. Um, we had a, a long list which we whittled down, um, did an interview process and, and really got a feel. And, and although Rob Taylor may not be uh, renowned in the world of rugby yet, uh, I believe that he's going to be a huge player in, in regards to the way we're going to go. Um, he is a uh, is a very astute man. He's had great success at Sydney, very, very highly thought of in, in Australia, and you'd know obviously a little bit better than I would. Um, but, um, yeah, he's, he's certainly very exciting. We're looking forward to getting him over and, and having him part of the team. Yeah, and as he touched on, you've obviously had some conversations with Rob, among others. What was it that you thought stuck out? Yeah, I think it's it's interesting. I mean, I, I was lucky to go over to Australia, South Africa, New Zealand in September, and I was kind of in between looking around what players were available. I was conscious of the fact that we needed to try and change up our coaching dynamics. So um, in some instances, what I love about Rob in the sense that we put a big list together, but in a lot of those instances, most of the reason that they're on a list is because they failed somewhere. And there aren't many opportunities you get to look at, pl- at coaches who are, not necessarily in the formative years, but basically are ready to take the next step up and have got success behind them, are well respected in their own country. And the other thing about coaching in Australia is there isn't the pathway that we see in England where people can kind of come through a system then go to a premiership team and work their ways through. There's a limited amount of teams in Australia. And, and I mean, I, I spoke to one of the people I spoke to was Michael Checker about him. And he was saying, look, he will not necessarily be able to break through because there won't be the opportunities. He hasn't been tainted by someone else's thinking. You're getting someone that's innovative, that's looking to actually make his mark, has a load of brilliant ideas, has won a lot of stuff in his role and can bring something different and unique to your proposition. So you get someone like that kind of singing their plaudits and you then kind of get some further evidence of what they could could do and I think that the nice thing about Rob as well is just that we have the link with Sydney University and I think they see their coaches like their players as being aspirational and I think this for him is a big step up he he happily admit that but he's really excited about the opportunity as are Sydney University and allowing him to come over and actually fulfill that wish and desire that he has to coach at the next level so I'm really excited about it as Geordie says I think um, we touched on it. He'll be uh, probably the oldest bloke in the coaching room apart from 40. So it's quite nice to have that that youth and, and enthusiasm that really wants to achieve things and hopefully move the club forward. You mentioned 40. Jordan, obviously, you know Mike quite well and, and have for some time as, you know, two quite old men. Um moving to defence where he's coached at international and obviously British Lions level. Is that the best fit for Mike? Yeah, I think that's a, he's a great addition. Mike's been fantastic for us, but his experience in, in, in international rugby and across the board at that top level has been on the defensive side of the ball. So, um, you know, Mike will be assisting with, with the, the coaching across the board, as will all of the coaches. You know, it's a collaborative effort, um, but his area of responsibility will be defence. Um, he's a, uh, as I said, he's got a lot of experience there and, and a, um, we believe that's going to be a, a, a real addition for us. In terms of the next coaching appointment, I've been lucky enough to do this for around a decade or more, and I don't think I've ever seen such a positive reaction to a head of performance or a head of S&C role as Alad Walters has been. I think you can see the testimonials from Springboks players, the way in which, you know, Rassi and South Africa farewelled him. Yeah, and I'll start with you, Alad. What is it that you looked for or what is it that you saw in Alad in terms of bringing him in? I think when we look at potentially bringing new faces into any environment, you want to look at what is your inherent DNA, but what also are the best aspects that you can take from other environments. And I think obviously we had probably a a similar to the coach, the the attack coach, we had probably a a list of 10 that was whittled down. And in many instances, he he was the standout candidate. Um, he's from a humble background in the sense that he's uh, a West Walian. Um, he kind of, there are probably similarities between Scarlets and then also Munster where he had a lot of success. Um, 
I think he's an incredibly personable individual. Um, and I think in that role, we're trying to get the best and the 1% out of individuals that goes a long way. Um, I think he's obviously been in an environment that's won a World Cup, which as a, an experience, and, and we're talking about potentially another long pre-season, it's quite good to have someone that's used to building up to a, in a long pre-season context. But I think also, like Steve's had some considerable lengthy conversations with him as well about where he believes performance can be. And to have potentially two World Cup finalists, one a winner on your coaching ticket in whatever aspect, I think is, is a huge asset for the club. Um, so look, I'm really excited about him joining. I think he'll bring um, a real enthusiasm into that role. Not to say that there isn't one there already. I just think it's just a, a different perspective. And I think I was lucky enough to come in and, and have a different slant on things from being in different environments. Um, Steve will do as too. And, and I think sometimes you just have to take whatever experiences you've got, the good and the bad, and actually bring those to the to the party. And hopefully that will work out. And look, I spoke to him the other day. He's incredibly excited about joining as we are as well. And as you say, it's fantastic for him and Rob both getting positive plaudits uh, with our social media followers because sometimes that isn't necessarily the case. Jordy, as a director of rugby in waiting, um, what is a head of phys- what is a head of physical performance? What do they do? Um, self-explanatory, really, Sam. <laughs> he's going to be he's going to be responsible for the physical performance. Um, <laughs> No, you know, I think that role is key, is pivotal. It's it's the one, two percenters. Um, you know, I think Jan touched on it, gave, gave Alid a, a really great um, referral. He's coming in with, with a huge amount of experience, uh, just w- having won a World Cup. Uh, I think one of the exciting things for me and around the coaching group uh, now is is that part of experience that we've got. You know, we've got Steve Borthwick, who's, you know, renowned as being one of the best international coaches um, we've got Alad, who's got experience from all over the world and having just won a World Cup. We've got Mike, who's you know coached at international levels for the Lions. You know, on the D side of the ball, we've got some great assistant coaches in Boris and Brett. Uh, and you know, I think I think one of the criticisms that could have been levelled at me or is levelled at me is that you know I've been at Leicester for a very long time, so I know I know Leicester. You throw all of that into a into a pot, and I think we've got more than enough experience in there to a uh, to make us a uh, um, successful. It- would you, to steal a quote from you, you called it a game changer in terms of bringing Steve and Allard in, obviously Rob as well. And I steal another quote from you on to the announcement yesterday of the development renewals. It's a new look Leicester Tigers. Is that? Yeah, well, you touched on it earlier on. You know, we haven't been good enough. and We needed to change. Um, my aspiration for Leicester Tigers is to have us back to the top end of the table, back to winning things. That doesn't just happen. There is no silver bullet that automatically guarantees you success. But we go back to the things that make Leicester Tigers good. We're going to work very, very hard for each other. Um, we're going to be very organized. We're going to be very disciplined. Um, these guys coming in will, will drive that. And um, it'll be an exciting journey. But I'm confident that I, uh, we're on the right path. I think so. the other thing just to say is, and, and this isn't necessarily talking kind of about Geordie when he's not here, but the reality is that Geordie inherited a situation unable to change a lot of what inherited so any change takes time and unfortunately in high performance sport that doesn't you don't necessarily get it but what and hopefully we've now got is some stability that allows Geordie that time so it's a two three four five year cycle in some instance, instances to try and get the right staff make up and also the play make up so I think in some regards Geordie's been firefighting a bit trying to also do a lot of roles that other people might have been coming to assist him with now. But I think it's just the start of this journey. I don't see it. As, it's not a quick fix, but we want it to be successful in the long run. But it takes time to establish those almost foundations to make it so. And I, and I think on that, Jan, I think, you know, from, from a board point of view, Simon, yourself, have been huge about that. Um, we've been under pressure. I've been under pressure. The board have come out and said we will get the right people in order to get us in the right place. And that isn't, as I said, an easy fix. You can't just go and cherry pick or have those instantaneously. Sometimes you have to wait until people are out of contracts. Um, but we've done that. And, you know, we've been in tough positions. We've, we've received criticism and worn that. And they, uh, you have to have the harsh times to appreciate the good. So, um, you know, I think people will always say, uh, will always be very pleased to see Leicester Tigers struggling. Um, and hopefully that won't be the case for too much longer. 
think what's been the nicest part of this week is the those that don't like us are probably a little bit jealous now of the makeup of that coaching room. And I think there's a few people reinvigorating that idea of if you don't like us, well, we're going to enjoy that fact. So oh, look, that, that, that's one of the things. Um, I think if, if, if teams are envious and teams don't like you, then you're doing your job well. Um, that was always a, something that Leicester Tigers did very well from, from the beginning. Um, we've, we've had periods of success, success and, and teams have been envious and teams have, have tried to emulate what we've had. Um, that hasn't been the case over the past while. We've got to, we've got to get ourselves into a position where we're, where we're back in there and, and people are uh, taking real pleasure in, a, uh, in giving us some stick. So if we move on to renewals in particular, obviously a, a bit of a two-part question. One is Johnny McPhillips is renewed and, and deservedly so, not that in this conversation my opinion is the one that carries weight with you two here. But I guess the criticism, if I can start with it, not to take away from Johnny, is we've had a fair a couple of outside backs depart. So we've re-signed another 10. We've obviously added Matt Scott. Um, you know, the obvious question is, I'm assuming more outside backs are to come. But in terms of that depth, are you happy with the makeup of the depth in, in the different areas? Yeah. Um, you know, as you said, it's, a, uh, it's not a finished piece just yet. Uh, we've got some more additions to make, some guys that, you know, we're, we're holding on and we'll let you know when they are ready to roll. Um, but, yeah, the, the squad is, is strong. You know, Johnny McPhillips uh, re-signing this week is, is great for us. Johnny... Had, a, had a, a really big year last year, working through, getting some game time in the championship, got himself into the team and, and then um, had a season-ending injury. Um, so it's, it's nice to have him on board through next preseason and, and into next year. Um, the, the, the squad makeup is, um, is where we want it to be. Um, we, uh, uh, we, you know, we've got the bodies in and we're just looking for a start date now so we can start to uh, ramp up our training. Yeah, and if I can ask you, not in each area, but in, in terms of making up a squad, is there a magic number for different positions in terms of how many you need? Or is it uh, about having guys who can cover different areas, different, I don't know, if that question makes sense. Yeah, I think um, the actual size squads across the league have come down. I think that's mainly because of the inflation of players' wages. Um, I think we'll be looking at a senior squad of around 37, 38 next year. Um, you look at where we traditionally were, even last year, we were around 45, 46, depending on it's 46, and then Dave Dench retired. Um, so I think Steve Diamond constantly talks about them probably having the, the slimmest senior squad in their low 30s, 32, I think. So I think that is a reflection across the league. Um, what are the right sizes? You're still going to need players that can cover a number of positions, ideally, if you've got a front row that can cover both sides. It's, Brilliant if you've got uh, your fifth lock, if they can play in the back row as well. That's outstanding. You're still going to probably need to go four in depth, probably a hooker, just because of the unique position it is. Nine as well. Um, but I think nowadays there is a big push towards versatility and the ability to play more than one position. Um, also to have more than, say, one goal kicker on the park. Um, so I think... That comes into it when you're looking at players' CVs and actually looking at their attributes. That adds that's a massive tick in their boxes to actually help them be considered. Um, so I think a lot of just looking on from obviously the various announcements um, and what we've done with Matt Scott coming in is that gives us a versatility around centre that we have a genuine option that can play both 12 and 13. Um, in the wing positions, we're obviously going to look at potentially strengthening that. Um, but also you want someone that's a backfield cover so that can cover 15. So, I mean, we talk about, say, Toulouse played international rugby on the wing for Tonga and has played his first season, played on the wing for Leicester. Um, we've also had players that come in, like Freddie Stewart, when he's come on, he's actually played wing and fullback. So George Worth can play fullback in 13. So I just think the it gives, especially when towards the end of the season, that's still going theoretically. Uh, we were having a 6-2 split on the bench. So to have the ability of players to play more than one position is huge, especially if you've got a nine that can cover wing and 15 or even. So um, it does come into the thinking. It comes into the thinking with the reduced numbers. Um, and so they might have to, um, I suppose, earn their money more by being able to be more versatile. But 
I think the other thing is players now are far more interchangeable. I mean, the, the amount of back rowers that can pretty much cover across the back row, it's very rare you get an out and out seven. Um, Tafu is probably a very good example of that. The fact he can cover genuinely all three positions, it just depends how we're playing. So, um, so yeah, in answer to your question, yes, yeah, squad sizes will become smaller. That's a consequence of finances, but also players' versatility is a huge asset to have. So, in many instances, we're quite lucky with the versatility of a lot of the new signings we've we've got. <coughs> probably worth pointing out then, Geordie, given your versatility, you'd be worth much more now. No. I doubt it. I wasn't very good. Um, I got away by playing in good teams. Uh, I'm bl- a great bluffer. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about that, but it's a it's nice when when a player can do a, a couple of different jobs. I mean, Kyle Brink is another example of that, isn't he? He's not necessarily a rusted on seven, six, or eight. No, again, uh, dynamic ball carrying back row. Um, I think you know predominantly six, seven, um, but um, has played some some rugby at eight as well. So. Um, gives us some options there in around what we do. Um, Hanro, obviously, who's been with us, has played predominantly six, can play eight, and, and can play in the second row as well. So what Jan's saying there is, is you know, the squad size has come down, but we have to have guys who we can um, swap and change. The nature of the Premiership, as he touched on earlier on, is, is it's attritional, um, and the way we want to train is, is certainly uh, one that that's going to make us say um, physically robust and, and um, the guys are going to have to uh, yeah, come in and, and be fresh and take opportunities when they get them. So talk to me about the development five that renewed then. Um, Ollie Ashworth, Tom Manns, George Martin, Jack Ben Portfleet, James Whitcomb, all guys who have had a taste of senior rugby this year. Obviously, Jack, I think, is the only who made his premiership debut against Sale. But the other four and the group as a five as a whole, we call them development players, but they're effectively part of the senior squad, aren't they? Yeah, the, you know, three of those guys had um, game time in around the England 20s this year in, in Whitcomb, uh, JVP and, and George Martin. Um, George had an injury, which, which sort of meant that he didn't see a lot of a, a game time, but we were pretty confident he was going to feature in the, in the England 20s. Um, Manzi and, and Ollie Ashworth um, have both really kicked on, um, had really strong seasons. Uh, Ollie played some some great rugby at Hinkley and, and Manzi at Loughborough. Um, so, you know, those guys are, they've earned those spots. They've, they've done well, they, they've worked hard, they've impressed. Um, it's, again, the start of a journey for them. Uh, it's not going to be easy for them, but, you know, if they continue to show the, the improvements and, and the attitude that they've had to their training, um, I can't see why they, they can't keep progressing. Tom Manns, yeah, and it's probably a question for you. Tom Manns represents a group of players who, when they might not make the step up from an academy level or even feature in an academy at a club, Mm. and you put him alongside the recruits of Oliver Chesham, I mean, Cameron Henderson and Dan Kelly, those four guys all had a taste of academy rugby at Tigers in different ways, Mm. maybe moved out of the system. I mean, Manzi was not in the academy, came back into the academy, won a title with the... And now he's got a development, he's got an extension. The dream is not over if you are not in an academy, is it? No, and I think the big thing for me is there are late developers in, in rugby. Um, some of the best players have been late developers. Um, so I think the thing for me, as you say, is like if you don't make it 18, it's not all lost. And the other thing, I think we're in a very unique position as a club to be able to support players to continue th- tertiary education we've got some fantastic universities near us both in in the city but also close by with Lusborough and Nottingham Um, and so we want to support them continuing their education now we're actually quite versatile and actually be able to work with the universities around the training programs and then continuing to study Um, and I think what that actually means is that we can then look to in Dan Kelly's instance he was at Loughborough already so he gets signed for two more years to be able to continue his studying whilst also playing for Ireland under 20s uh, but he's English qualified um, with the other guys and the other thing to point out is that probably if you look at the valuation of players across the world now goal kicking tens tight heads the second rows are now becoming more and more of a commodity that's actually a highly priced commodity so I I was almost of the mindset, and we were, that if we've got one of the best international forward coaches in the world who's captain his country from second row, with a club with a pretty decent history in producing decent second rows who've gone on to captain their country, 
we should have as many good ones in the system to try and get them as good as they can possibly be. So we don't have to bring guys in from outside. So yes, we brought Cammy Henderson from Scotland, but he's EQP. But George Martins obviously comes through the system as a Tom Manns. Oli Chesham has come through, played for us in the A-League. So to bring him into the system is great. Tom Manns will be a late developer. He's actually the tallest guy in the actual overall squad. Um, but I just, I'm actually, I get so much satisfaction and I really get really excited about seeing there's no price or there's no you can't put a price on what the future can hold for some players and just you can't cap it either so you don't really know how good some guys can be I have some huge huge aspirations for some of those individuals because I genuinely genuinely believe they'll be world-class operators and, and represent their country in the future. So at 29 with a bad back is my dream over. <laughs> no, you're, you're, you're <laughs> not. Your ability is your liability. <laughs> I would have a go. I think I might be red carded pretty early on though. Okay. Um, tell me about the academy kids because last year I think we welcomed, was it the biggest influx yeah. ever in the club's history in terms of 12 bodies coming up? Six more this season, you know, several the year prior, which means – over three years after three academy title wins, we've seen more than 20 guys make the step up. Yes, some move in and out. These six in particular, Jordy, I'll start with you, not necessarily one by one, but what was it that you saw in these six in terms of being capable to make the step up and the, the conversations you, Jan, and obviously Jed Glynn had around these guys coming through? Uh, Jan's touched on it. There's great potential in the six guys. Um, they showed a great attitude throughout their um under 18s league this year um the step up was 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 huge the way they worked the way they attacked every training session um they really exhibited some some um some things that we want to see in the senior setup um again it's it's going to be difficult for those guys it's it's not an easy road um they have to come in and they have to earn their stripes they're going to have to work harder again next year than they did last year um but you know some of the, those forwards coming through Archie Vanes and young Jack Roundtree um will be pretty exciting um his father, if he if he has anything to do with it, will obviously give him some great advice, and, and they uh, we can hopefully have him kick on. Um, but yeah, it's it's a, it's an exciting time for, for those guys. How old do you feel seeing another roundtree coming through? Yeah, I I know that I'm very very old. I felt <laughs> old, but yeah, a few years ago when one of the uh, lads asked me, did I play? So um, <laughs> that, was, that was probably the, the moment that I realised that I really was playing this one. It- if I'm right in thinking, Emeka Ilioni will probably, if Tom Manns is the tallest person at Leicester Tigers, Emeka Ilioni will step into the role as the smartest person at Leicester Tigers. He a young medical very, student? Yeah, he had the opportunity to go to UCL or Kings, which are the fifth or sixth best medical studying programs in the world. Um, his, uh, his family are, I think, they're both medics in some capacity. Um, I think um, he was unlucky with injury this year as well, um, but he had led the team before the year before. Um, and he's also played England as well, uh, under 18s. Um, so for him, it's going to be a bit of a balancing act. I think we've probably shown quite a lot of faith in him because he is going to go study at one of those institutions. And so there's going to be a bit of trying to follow a rugby program. We're going to, with a team in London in some aspects, but we envisage him still being involved with England 20s in some capacity. Um, a hugely talented kid in so many aspects. Um, I think he could, he recognises the amount of work that will have to go in on both fronts uh, with a hugely supportive family and hopefully a family in the sense of the club as well. But I think we have every faith in him that he will be able to do that because he's an immensely capable young man. You save money on a doctor, can't you, if he's out on the pitch playing? It's that almost a Jamie it Roberts scenario, isn't it? I'm sure he'll end up being the next doc, but um, on the on the squad. But uh, just a really likable kid as well, and I just you just wish and hope that they can come through and fulfil all the dreams they have. If you haven't seen his try, I think for England under 18s or 20s, when whoever it was last season, it's about as close to Tom Croft as you're going to get in terms of Sorry. a I haven't actually seen blind it. side <laughs> flanker running away from about 50 metres out. Um, Geordie, or probably more so for Yan, actually, in terms of the six kids, is it all about timing and the, the squad spots you need to fill positionally? 
there's there's a little bit of that um, and a little bit of a uh, forward planning and, and obviously um, we're conscious that if we see gaps that we need to fill we would like to fill them from within um, some of it is is not that important in that we want to give the guys opportunities as well we want to give guys a um, it's not a closed shop if they're the best players on the field and they've got a great attitude and they're good human beings then we want them in our environment um, so there is a combination yeah definitely we, we look at where at the roles we're trying to fill in if we can fill from within our own environment we would rather do that and, and save yana a, a difficult job of scouring the world but um sometimes that's not possible yeah and can you tell me a little bit about exactly who's in charge of the process or who's working on the process in terms of, I would imagine Geordie that while you'd love to be at every Academy game, you can't be. So therefore the team of yourself and Jed Glynn, uh, Dave Wilkes, Matt Smith, who exactly is having the conversations and who's making the decisions ultimately on this is the six. So I think the, I think the process has been really well done this year. Um, it helps in the sense that Dave and Jed have been part of, to two successful campaigns historically. So you kind of get a feel for what would look right in a senior development squad role. Um, between Dav Mele, Matt Smith, Jed and Dave, they were asked after each game, who would they effectively promote into the development squad? And I think bar one or two names, pretty much the group that you see now is pretty consistent with what stood out for them each week. Um, Dave's probably slightly more influential in the sense that he uh, and Matt and Dave will see them training, but I suppose Dave's also dealing with the schools, getting feedback from them. He's dealing with the parents. He's dealing with the individuals as well and getting a feel for them as people. Um, Jed's watched a huge amount of rugby um, over 45 years, I'm sure, since he was playing at that, that, that age. Um, but he'll be, happy, um, he'll be happy he gave that away. That was generous. <laughs> you, you, you've just he only started playing at thirty. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think we're incredibly lucky to have that experience within our system to be able to count on. You've also got Dusty there as well. He's he's seen more young international players come through any system than anyone else. So to have him to be able to go along and watch them, uh, he, he's very good. Him and Jed together can, have got a fantastic eye to be able to see what success looks like in a young athlete. Now, there's always a question mark. We, you never know if they're going to be able to, there might be injury, they might not necessarily grow. Um, but I think a lot of it will boil down to attitude. And I think as Geordie touched on, we've, we're very lucky in the sense that the ability of those players to step, step up and train with the first team is, is pretty phenomenal. They're, they're, they're conscious of not being coach killers. They want to show themselves in the best light. And, and so... You've probably seen it also. I think probably Harry's a really good example of the fact that he got some A-League time, game time this year. Um, and and look, that wouldn't have come unless the coaches have full confidence in him be able to be able to perform at that level and train with those guys who are older than him at that level as well. Geordie, how excited are you for the duo of Kit Smith and Archie Vaines, given that they're pseudo-psychopaths on the pitch? Oh, look, all of those guys it will um, be great to see how they go in the senior setup. Um, Kit Smith, I've been really impressed with. I watch the Academy games when, when I can, and um, he's been one of the standout performers. And I like that, you know, two guys who, who don't take a step backwards. Um, the step up between that rugby and, and the rugby that they're going to face next year is, is pretty big, but I'm confident that they've got the right attitudes to do it. Um, a physical development block and, and a, uh, a little bit of time added into the right attitude and, and, and they're very good human beings to add to boot. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to their uh, arrival into the first team setup. This is probably one to help you out at home. I'm sure you're both telling both of your wives that it's a really hard time and you're really busy and you can't look after the kids now. So I want to ask you, it seems to me that there's been a lot of wins, especially this week in terms of those announced, some massive announcements in the coaching department, some really, really exciting announcements in terms of renewals. And then you've got these six kids. It has been undoubtedly more challenging than what is already a challenging process in terms of recruiting and retaining people. But you must be happy and you must be patting yourselves on the back, you and, and the rest of the staff, in terms of what's been able to be done during this period. I, I think patting ourselves on the back is going a step too far. As we stand I'll pat you on the, the back. Um, I think for me, I'm, I'm just excited. I've 
I came in end of June last year. Um, I obviously had different experiences in different environments and all I wanted to do was try and help move the club forward. Um, probably this was my first opportunity to try and help shape and, and give some support to Jordan and the rest of the coaches moving forward. Um, I believe, as I said, I think we're starting to put some really good foundations in place. Um, the reality is this is where the st hard work now starts. We've actually put some really good thought and processes into place and with some coaches that can really add some value into the environment. We're going to put, we've brought in a few players that we believe that will add to the current squad, but ultimately we need to make the squad better. We need them to win more games and we want them also to walk into work with a smile on their face. I said it to Jordy the other day, like, I love what I do, but I also love walking into work and having a smile on my face and being positive. Now, we're very, very privileged. We get to work for the biggest club in the country and we hopefully can build this club back up to where it should be. But ultimately, I want to have some fun doing it. And I think if we can ensure that players also have some fun and we'll get Steve to laugh as well, it will be good. When you, I think it's a nice segue into as much as it's nice to have these coaching appointments and these young kids. And I, I think we're still forgetting we've announced some major additions in terms of senior squad guys and not only in name and experience, but size based on Namani alone. But <laughs> I don't think there's been a bigger recruit than that of Steve Borthwick for a long time in rugby. And in terms of the coup that Leicester Tigers or the clubs made there, Geordie, I know we've discussed it briefly, but when you think about it as a game changer or this new look Leicester Tigers, as you referred to it, Steve Borthwick and, and yourself will essentially now be in charge of all that. And as much as we've liked talking about it, as Jan's alluding to, now you've got to get to work, don't you? Yeah, well, we're, we're uh, yeah, sort of being curtailed a little bit by COVID at the minute. But, you know, as you said, we went out uh, a little while ago and we set our sights on getting the best possible head coach that we could uh, and I'm excited that Steve's that guy um, he's as we said you know vastly experienced in the international game he's an incredibly impressive guy um, really honest really hard working um, he's going to reflect uh, exactly what we're about and um, I'm very excited about getting him up and getting him settled in uh, again in this COVID and, and hopefully we'll, we'll know a little bit more on, on a uh, in a couple of days time exactly where the lay of the land is um, but his contract will start on the 1st of July and as of then I'm sure he'll be here um, working uh, as hard as he possibly can to get us uh, back to where I am, um, we want to be. In terms of protecting my job for a little bit longer as well, I think it's only fair that obviously we heard from Peter Tom last week or, or the week before. I can't, cannot for the life of me know what day or week it is at any time at the moment. But the support that you two get, yeah, and I'll start with you, not only Peter Tom, the entire board, which includes obviously Simon Cohen, Andrew Pynchon and Ian Walker as well. Yes, they've copped flack. I think Peter was quite telling in the fact that he said they deserved some flack. But I think one of the points for me was the people don't really celebrate the board ever. It's very good at blaming a board when you're not going well, but no one's going, oh, Peter Tom's also been chairman for a long time and seen a lot of trophies. Um, it, yeah. What's that support network been like for you, I guess, compared to previous roles? Look, I, I've been... I was, it's been outstanding from the moment I walked in the door. Um, I was lucky that I'd known Simon in a previous life uh, and dealt with him both effectively, not necessarily on one side of the table when I had players that were playing for the club. Um, and actually, those negotiations, ironically, were pretty easy. I represented Richard Cockrell and he was a client of mine, so I had to deal with uh, Pete Wheeler as well. Um, so I've known Peter Tom for a fair bit of time. Um, I didn't know Andrew. I'd, I'd basically sent fee letters to Ian Walker, so I didn't necessarily know Ian uh, apart from his name. Um, but no, from the moment I came in, they've been outstanding. Um, they've all been there to support me, give me effectively the tools I've needed to try and do my role, uh, give me the support I've needed to try and implement new processes and procedures. Um, and I do think, uh, in particular, Simon gets a lot of flack from various corners. Um, I suppose having been in a position for a period of time, it happens in the sports industry. Um, a lot of people I don't think know the extent to which he works and, and kind of the length of hours he does and also the input he gives. Uh, I know that the chairman's incredibly grateful for 
that, especially from a legal background as well. Um, but also just even in the, just kind of the, probably the process around Rob's um, appointment, probably the most in-depth I've done from a coaching perspective, like myself, Geordie, Jed, Simon and Steve had a, a numerous Zoom calls and conversations and meetings around what that dynamic should look like and debated the various candidates. And what I liked was the debates weren't one-sided, like everyone's got an opinion, whether it's right, ultimately it's Geordie and Steve say, um, and, and Geordie has that final call. But I think ultimately you've got to respect the fact that Simon's been in the industry 30 years, Jed's been around coaching for a similar time. Uh, I've got 17, 18 years in the industry. Steve's been an international or international coach for nine, 10 years. Um, and Geordie's been part of the club for 17 years, having been top end international and worked through and won trophies. So I challenge most clubs to have that depth of knowledge around a pure kind of recruitment forum. Um, and, and as much as like, I'd like to think I can do it all on my own, ultimately we're in this as a team and we want to make sure that not necessarily, you're never going to get it all right. And some instances, some of it, one or two players might not work out for whatever reasons, but I think by minimising that risk because you flushed out the questions and gone through that process, it makes you a lot more confident about the players you're bringing in. Um, I think one of the things on that, Jan, is um, all of those people that you've talked that are incredibly passionate and really care about the club. Um, I think when things are tough, um, people don't always see that. People don't always see that the hard, hardship that people are going through and, and the amount of work that people are putting in and behind the scenes. Um, but have sort of when you're in that circle, you, you see you see the pain, you see how it affects people, you see how they're redoubling their efforts uh, and trying to get it right. So um, from from Jan's point of view, you know I've been very lucky uh, on the same breath that the support shown by, by the entire board and, and those people that mentioned it has been a uh, pivotal to us, you know, keep going. Yeah, and I mean, I did mention Geordie has one of the longest titles in rugby, but you uh, you're certainly rivaling him. You and Jed Glynn basically have covered a few different languages, alphabets in all of your titles. Um, I was attempting to try and find your title, but it's actually shut down my whole network trying to load. It's a head of elite performance recruitment. <laughs> I kind of, I've had a few, of, I suppose it depends on being head of operations, head of sports operations, head of recruitment, head of elite performance recruitment. So I don't really care what the title is, to be honest. Um, you just care about uh, wearing the suit. <laughs> to, to touch on it, I mean, we could go into depth with it. And I think actually what you've done is explain it in terms of your responses already. But you, you, your job at Leicester Tigers, effectively, could you tell me what it is? Um, yeah. In a nutshell, it's effectively to try and support the coaches to try and find the best recruits from a coaching and playing perspective. I think... The reality is that now the game is a truly global game and it goes throughout the year. Um, we've, What I've always tried to do is been tried to hopefully be ahead of peers in trying to know what the best next talent coming through the system is. I think one of the tasks I set myself when I joined was I wanted to try and find 95% of the players out of contract by our first um, Premiership Cup game, so the 21st of September. So went down to South America, went to New Zealand, Australia and South Africa basically met with agents, met with coaches' agents. And so I'd like us to be at the forefront of people's minds when they're thinking about someone either looking for an opportunity overseas or a player at a, at a, at a premiership team that's English qualified that wants to be coached by the best coaches in the league. Um, now, they're pretty lofty aspirations, but I didn't come here to not win things. I think every single member of that coaching staff wants to win things, as do the board. So, um, And the players, I know there's some... In particular, you talk from Tom Young's down. There's some George Ford, Dan Cole. Um, there's a lot of players that are desperate to win things and going back to winning ways. That's why Ellis resigned. That's why Manu's here. So, like, it's it's me. I'm here just to basically help assist those guys try and find the best candidates. So, whatever that looks like, whether that's helping to find the next generation of players in lower leagues with our scouts to assist in Jed to find, find those guys that come through our academy and with all the academy staff to going out to market and overseas markets to try and find the guys and sell them the dream to come to the Tigers. But ultimately, it helps having a successful team. So that's going to be our focus moving forward. 
in terms of a baptism of fire, I'm sure you weren't planning for COVID. I'm sure you weren't planning for no Harrison situation and everything else. In terms of rugby as a whole, to put you on the spot a little bit with something I'm sure you weren't prepared for, but we touched on the smaller squad sizes and obviously conversations at the moment are surrounding, you know, pay cuts and inevitable funding issues for the game across the globe. It's not specific to the premiership or European clubs. We don't want to reiterate that, but is this a seriously big turning point for rugby from your point of view? I think what it's done is effectively allow people to start having honest and frank conversations around the state of the game. I think the reality is that we are, we've got a number of sources of income, whether that be from TV revenue to sponsorship to hospitality to gate receipts to season ticket holders. Um, and every single country in the world's rugby market is the same. The difference is, is when either those affected are affected by a pandemic or the economic conditions mean that subsequently there isn't as much finances to go around. So I think what this has allowed us to do is say, well, as a collective between the 13 premiership clubs, we lost, I think, 45 million roughly last year. Um, on average, each club is losing between two to four million pounds. Um, the reality is that majority of clubs turnovers is to do with players wages. So if this means there's an opportunity to reassess what that looks like, I think most administrators, chairmen, owners and boards will probably take the opportunity. Um, so I think we have to plan for a number of eventualities. Um, I think in the future it could look different, whether that's two, three years down the line. It's like anything, no one really knows what that looks like. But I think what it has done is allow us to start having some conversations around how do we ensure the longevity of the business and how do we ensure that clubs are here in five years' time rather than falling off the map because they've had to go into administration because they can't afford to exist? Geordie, from your point of view, I mean, I know you weren't necessarily playing at the top level when professionalism came in because that would make you a little bit older than you are and I won't, I won't paint you with that brush. But you certainly would have been aware of the time and coming through the ranks as a young rugby player is this one of the more significant times since then that you've seen in the game? Yeah, it's, this, is, this has been a um, huge for the game of rugby, in my opinion. Uh, I came through in 97, 98, and the game had turned professional, I think, in 96. Um, rugby, when I was a youngster, was never, uh, there was never the possibility of doing it uh, as a job. It was just something that you did because you loved it. Um, all of my brothers had played youngest of six kids, and they'd all gone out on a Tuesday and a Thursday and played for the local team. and reached higher honours say uh, for for just for for the enjoyment of the game so so i think i came through in an era when it was um the game was growing and and it's grown for for the last 20 22 years in in my opinion it, it's grown it's grown um i think over the last probably 5 years it, we've maybe gone a little bit ahead of ourselves and all of the clubs as Janice just touched on has uh, found ourselves in in, in sort of uh, difficult financial positions um, and it's not sustainable it's taken covid to to drop the hammer on that so um you know i think like jan jan said it, it's a it's an interesting time in that you know we just have to stop check and um, see where we're at uh, the most important thing for Leicester tigers is that we're still a successful rugby club in, in 100 years time and and um you know i've been really impressed by the players and um, by the staff the way they've supported the club in this tough time um, and um, yeah, I think that's what we're about. So we're just going to make sure that we're I am um, we're still here in another hundred years. Coley will still be playing. Youngest of six brothers makes a lot of sense with you. Really, that start that's painting that's starting to understand now the puzzle that is Jordan Murphy. That you're well, the youngest of six brothers. I don't know if it's a puzzle. No, four, four, <laughs> four brothers and a sister. Youngest of six, but she, youngest of six. Sorry, she, she's probably the most feared. I want to finally to wrap up the chat around this stuff one for you both we keep talking about the pathway and the strategy to develop with from within the clubs accepted it wasn't good enough for a period of time I mean you couldn't argue with the fact that it's been very good for the last three years given they've won three titles in a row I know we spoke about the academy last week with Coley from your perspectives Geordie yours is probably more of just a Tigers perspective and making sure those players come through as what the club is trying to develop from a young age. But from Jan's point of view, Jan, I guess if I start with you, 
you obviously do present yourself with issues that we've seen at Saracens, not to hide from that fact that if you do develop fantastic squads, you're not going to be able to keep them all. But on a positive slant, why is it so important to bring through your own youth and bring through a core of youth rather than just the odd player here and there? I think probably take Saracens slightly out of the equation because obviously that's slightly tarnished, but obviously looking across the league, Exeter are probably the standout club that has done a fantastic job with their academy. It helps that pretty much on the M5 from Exeter down, they've got, that's their hot bed of rugby. Um, I think for them is every single kid within that stretch down to Cornwall St. Ives wants to play for Exeter. And I think what we recognise is we have such a huge local rich history that we want to tap into that so that players want to put on the shirt. And I think we, we do touch on the fact that we want to encourage a successful academy team to become a successful development players to start coming through the first team. Um, I think that needs to be put with a slight caveat of when they are good enough. Like Geordie's going to select them purely based on their playing ability, not because they've just happened to be through the system. And I think we, if you look at some of those players that come through, even in the Saracens instance and Exeter, weren't coming through at 18, 19, 20. They were coming through 22, 23, 24. Um, and it was because they'd actually been loaned out to Division One teams or local teams to get their rugby opportunity. So um, I'm, I'm, I do, I'm a massive believer in the system. I think also... It, it kind of works from a far more economic perspective because you don't have to go out to the market overseas to bring players in. And, and it also, I think we have the largest pure rugby seat to stadium in the country. And to have people in the terraces that have known the history of a kid that's come through a local setup close to them is invaluable. You can't buy that. And that's why people turn up to watch those players. So I'm a huge believer in making sure that those, those athletes have the opportunities to play but they also need to be good enough. And we need to be good enough to actually make sure as our coaches are good enough to get them up to the standard they need to be, in my belief, in the most hardest professional league in the world at the moment. Jordy, from your point of view? Ah, that's pretty comprehensive an answer. Um, we want young men who know what we're about, who really care about the place, who are passionate, tough, driven. Uh, and really put it in. And if you've grown up watching Leicester Tigers on the terraces and your your aspirations are to represent Leicester Tigers, you go out, you give everything, you grow, develop uh, as a player and, and the coaches help you do that. And if, when you're good enough, you'll get your opportunities. And they, um, I think we've seen guys like Dan Cole, like Tom Young's come through the ranks and, and really um, be inspirational in, in a Leicester shirt. And that's what I want for these guys. And just to round all of this out so I can stop answering questions online about it, to clarify, there will be further additions to the playing squad ahead of next season. When the time is right. <laughs> <laughs> we said last week we'd have some more for you this week, Sammy, and, and now, you're, you're a, uh, now you're hitting us up again. We'll, we'll tell you when we're ready. All right, cool. So people can stop asking us. Geordie, from your perspective, I just want to finish on... Uh, People are wondering when rugby back will be back. People are wondering when rugby will return. I guess if I can lead you slightly in the questioning, this decision is out of the hands of Premiership Rugby and European Rugby, isn't it? Yeah, look, you know, we want to be guided by what the government's saying. Hopefully we get something in regards to that this weekend. This, this is a pandemic. People's health is, is vital and, and, and of the most important. Um, you know, as we've touched on, the NHS doing a fantastic job. We want to be uh, supporters of that and we don't want to be a... Um, causing problems. So we're all desperate to be back out there uh, pulling on Tiger shirts and, and representing, but we have to do the right thing. So a um, couple of days' time, we'll, we'll get some guidelines and, and then we'll be able to make firmer plans from there. But uh, the players are in standby, ticking over, ready to a, uh, be given the, the, the green light to, to get the season finished. And obviously, Jan, I mean, I, I have to ask, Geordie and I have been secretly texting through this conversation we're both pretty certain that you've got some form of board shorts or boxer shorts on that you're not wearing a full suit. So you're going to have to prove that. Give us a twirl. Ah, knew it. Boxer shorts. Knew it. Boxer shorts. Knew it. You have to, uh, I, I don't know, I was trying to keep the lie going for the whole interview. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would stand up, but then we couldn't show this online because I'm not wearing anything at all. Um, so, 
Gentlemen, I thank you for that. I, I appreciate that it's obviously Friday night of a long weekend. Um, you uh, are happy, happy VE day, Sam. Happy VE day. Yes. Uh, we should say a shout out to all of our uh, servicemen, colleagues and friends who've done us proud over the years. Thank you. All our fallen comrades. Yes. Uh, yeah, and it's up to you now to tell us who we should speak to next week. Not that we spoke to Boris this week. We spoke to you instead. But um, Please, Boris, you can tell us who you think we should speak to. We're not going to speak to them, but it's just nice for you to have a feeling of it, you know. I quite like interviews with 40. George. Yeah. I think I think like the ones you've done with him on, on this platform have been really good. I, I've got a lot of time for George. I think he's an outstanding individual. And I think he's going to be pivotal to how we move this club forward. But um, I, I I just think he's he's got quite a dark sense of humour, which I don't think sometimes comes out. So I think if you've got some good questions from him, I think he'd be outstanding. So either that or, again, I don't know whether Genji would do it, because he's probably, he's, he might have to go through his publicist at the moment. But um, I always like uh, his honesty. Um, he's, he's had some pretty honest conversations with me in my uh, first year of being here. Um, we started off potentially on the wrong foot. We ended up getting there, all right? And uh, I consider him someone I like having a chat with. But um, I think he'd be quite a good value as well. Geordie, there's surely an argument for a former teammate of yours to come on at some point. I don't know who. I don't think we could do the live interviews with someone like Lewis Moody, but... Um... Uh, I think, I mean, again, I think you should run a poll. Over the weekend, run a poll. You get a, uh, we'll see if we can get Martin Johnson on. He'd be a nice one, wouldn't he? I'm not sure if he'd, uh, he'd come. Um, Lewis would be keen. Crofty. Uh, Crofty would be good. Uh, Leon Lloyd would be very good. Um, Maybe someone like Garth. Garth would be world class. But again, you might have to edit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd love to see if you could get cockers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Just how whether or not it actually gets broadcast in Scotland. <laughs> well, I do know that the chairman is going to do a follow up to his, so that's quite exciting. And I do know as well that the CEO is going to face some questions as well in the coming weeks. So uh, I'm not sure we'd. I think you should get Andrea on. I think she'd be very good. There's probably an argument there, isn't there? What, lurking in the shadows, Andrea. <laughs> lurking in the shadows at the moment, so we might have to give her a call. All right, I think you've probably expired your time in terms of your wives looking after the children. So, yeah, and you can go and get your um, the rest of your beach outfit on. Thanks. I'll see if the house is still standing as soon as I walk out the door. And, Geordie, I'll speak to you again next week. Thank you for your time. Cheers.